Welcome to this series from Resurrection Life Church in Granville, Michigan. We're going to get started tonight. Um, the title of, of the message today is called Good. Good. And, um, you know, When I first started, I, for those of you who are new, I, st- I just started this position speaking. I think this is my third time speaking um, in a row since, since Pastor Kurt has left. And, you know, I was thinking, God, like, what? Like, what do you want? Like, what is the purpose of, like, coming to church, what's the purpose of all this? Like, what, what do I need to do in order to do my job effectively? How can I be the best that I can be at communicating the word of God? What I really felt God telling me is that it's, is that it's not about just having a better day. It's not about just me coming here and giving you three steps to a better tomorrow. But the purpose of this place, the purpose of the church, the purpose of access and what the message that I and Nick and the leadership is to give people a chance to just encounter God and to meet with him because guess what? Anyone can have a better tomorrow, but not everyone gets a transformed life. And that's what we want to do here is is to open it up and to allow God to work in the Holy Spirit's power to minister to your hearts, not just to have a better day, but to have a brand new life. Because that's what you were made for. You weren't made just to have a better day. He came for more than just a better day. He came for more to make us brand new. New creations transformed by the love of God. So I don't know why, but I just felt like I really had to share that before uh, we get into this. And that's really serious. And my next thing I'm going to say is not serious at all. So um, <laughs> so is anybody here like games? Like raise your hand if you like games. I knew Ronzi would like games. So... <laughs> And I purposely didn't tell my wife that I was going to tell about this game because I knew she probably would discourage me. So, I love this game, okay? I love this game, and some of you might have played it or a form of it, but it's called Body Body. Raise your hand if you've played Body Body. I know all these people over here because I've played, most, played with most of them. Um, or it's a spinoff. Has anyone ever played Mafia? Yeah. Mafia? Yeah. So raise your hand if you've never heard of either of those games. So I know who I'm talking to here. Okay. <laughs> so let me, let me explain you these games. And you have to bear with me, okay? I'm a little kid at heart. I mean, I was going to school to be an elementary school teacher, so you know I got to be a little bit childish here. <laughs> and I love this game. I love this game. Funny story is the fr- when I... You know, when I was interviewing for um, the job at Access and this position, one of the first things my wife told me was, you know, Jake, you're probably going to have to stop playing body body. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're right. <laughs> it was, that was actually one of the deciding factors. I was like, okay, I can take this job, but I'll miss out on body body. I don't know what to do here. <laughs> when, weighing the factors. But anyways, how you play this game is you have like a group of people. Usually you need like a good number of people, like 10 10 people and you have a deck of cards, but you only have, you use 10 cards. You use two, uh, two face cards and all the rest will be non-face cards. And for those of you who don't know cards or deck of cards, face cards are the jack, queen, and king. <laughs> and all the other cards are non-face cards. They're called face cards because there's faces on them. <laughs> and um, so if you get there's only two face cards, the rest are non-face cards. And so if you get, you pass, I'm sorry, you shuffle them up, you pass them out, and you look at it, you keep it a secret, and if you have a face card, you're called the mafia, or you're called the killer, okay? 
And so you don't share that information with anyone. You keep it a secret. So if you look at it, okay, I'm the mafia. Everyone else looks at it. Other people are like, okay, I'm just like a normal, they call him like a townsperson. It's weird, I know. Okay, I just get over it. <laughs> um, so then you put all the cards down. You know who you are if you're the killer or the mafia. You shut all the lights off in the house. Or we're in the building that you're playing. And you just walk around. And you have to be silent. And if you're the killer, the object is to kill, not really kill, but <laughs> to take out some, the other people, the other, um, your opponents basically. But no one knows who's who. So it's kind of like, for, girls get really scared because it's in the dark. They're like, ah, someone's going to tap me. Ah. So the way you kill them is you tap them on the head. So once you tap them on the head, you fall down, and then the, the killer will like walk away, and then somebody else will come in the room, and they'll like trip over them, and they'll be like, oh, body, body, body. So then they, so then after somebody yells body, body, you come back together. So now there's only nine people. Ten minus one is nine. And, and then you try to figure out who, the, who killed that person. So there's a lot of arguing, and there's a lot of yelling, and you'll say, so for instance, let's say somebody sees body, body, and I'll say, well, I saw, uh, well, I saw Michael uh, walking out of that room right before somebody called body, body. He must be the mafia or the killer. So then you try to convince and like persuade other people to vote your way. It's really a fun game, <laughs> especially when you play with people who are very argumentative, <laughs> like myself. So, but what I found out is that the great, the great mafia, the great killers are the ones who know how to frame other people. Noah Havernick. <laughs> this guy right here, he's the mastermind. He knows exactly when to touch someone on the head so it looks like somebody else did it. So then when they come all together, you're like, well, I saw him. And then Noah chimes in, yeah, I saw them too. And then everyone will vote for that person. And once you vote for that person, they get eliminated from the game. And then the mafia is still on. So the goal is to get, the goal is for the mafia to last throughout the whole game. But if you're, if you're going to be a good mafia or a good killer, you have to be able to frame other people. Do you see the card when they die? No, you don't see the card when they die. You, you just don't know. Really fun game. Really fun game. And now there's a point to the story, and I'll get to it. But before I do that, I want to tell you about a story about my buddy who's a youth pastor in Tennessee. So we played this game with him, and so he took it down to Tennessee, and he's playing with his kids, and they have this new kid in, in, their, um, in their youth group, and he's a, you could say he's maybe a little rough around the edges. I don't know him, but from the story I'm going to tell you, you'll know what I mean. Um, so they're playing, and they're playing mafia, having a good old time, and all of a sudden they're walking, and it was in the church, and it was dark. Somebody taps this kid on the head. He turns around, and boom, and just knocks <laughs> the kid to the ground. He's like, you ain't, you ain't killing no one. <laughs> You're down. And so there's no real point to that story, just some people take it a little too far. It's a good game, though. It's a good game. I want to share a verse with you. It's uh, John 10.10. 10. It says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief here, in context, is talking about the religious leaders. But the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were motivated by, you could say, uh, demonic spirits, evil spirits. It's the devil that was motivating them, this, this, this way of thinking that was contrary to life, that was contrary to the way that Jesus was teaching. So you could say that the, 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 the devil comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I, this is Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Other translations say, have life and life more abundantly, which means excessively. Jesus came for more than just to get us into heaven. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. That's good news.
So I only have two points today. My first point is really um, profound. It's the devil's bad. (laughs) The devil is bad. So John 10, 10, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So this is, this is my point from this. The devil is bad. All death, all destruction, all loss, all sickness, all of it comes from the devil. That's right. All of it. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's not this case, nor that, that case. All of it. All death, loss, destruction comes from the devil. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's not one good bone in his body. He's got no good genes. He's hopeless. He's lost. And he's trying to reproduce that in mankind. That hopelessness and, that, and, and his lostness, you could say. So from the beginning, the devil has been deceiving. So the devil, he's bad. He causes all lo- loss, death, destruction. But... He doesn't like to take ownership of it, of the death, loss, and destruction. He actually likes to frame someone else. Just like in Body Body, you know, the, the best killer is the one who doesn't get caught. He frames the other person. The devil loves to frame God for the work that he does. He loves to, he loves, he doesn't set God up. God can't be set up. He loves to set us up to believe a lie. So he's a deceiver. He, from the beginning, he's been lying. That's all he's been doing. John eight forty four says, for you are the children of the father of the devil. This is talking about the Pharisees and, and, their, and their speak that was just all lies. It was all just relig- religious babbling. You love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. You guys, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. There's, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. He knows nothing but to lie. So you're, you're either gonna hear three voices when, when throughout your life, throughout your day. You're either gonna hear God's voice, you're gonna hear your own mind, or you're gonna hear the devil's voice. And it's very important that we know and we can distinguish between the three of those. But the problem is, is if you never spend time with someone, you actually don't even know their voice. If you never actually, if you don't have a relationship with someone and they call you on the phone, you'll, you think it's a stranger. But when you spend time and you know someone, you actually know their voice. And when a fa- if a little kid, <laughs> if you have a little baby, like a two-year-old, you've seen it, you've all experienced it. If you've been around little kids, they know their parents' voice, right? My mom has this whistle. <laughs> it is so loud. I could be a mile away and I hear it, I'm just like, because I know it. You know it. You know the voice. So he's a liar, so it's important that we know the truth if he's only speaking lies, right? So we're going we're gonna to go into the truth tonight. And the first point is the truth. The devil's bad. It's the truth. The lie that he's trying to tell you is that God's the orchestrator of the bad things in your life. He's the one who's causing the bad things in your life. It's just not the truth. He actually tries to trick us. He lies in order to corrupt our perspective so that we think the events and the things that are happening to us are actually caused by God. He's trying to deceive us to believe that God is trying to teach us a lesson. God is not trying to teach you a lesson by putting bad things in your life. He's not trying to teach you a lesson by putting sickness and, and, and pain in your life. He's just not trying to teach you a lesson. That's a good word. Come on. And we, when we said it before when I was going through that. God's actually so for you that you can't even imagine. There's not a bad bone in his body. He doesn't have a body. He's a spirit. There's no, there's no evil in him. There's none. 
And we need to know the nature of God. We need to know the voice of God because if we don't, if we know it, then we'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's a lie that says what you don't know won't hurt you. It's actually the, the opposite. What you don't know will kill you. Because if you don't know the truth and you're believing a lie. So he's trying to trick us, right? He's trying to trick us into believing that God somehow has something to do with the bad stuff in our life. And a lot of us have believed it, myself included. We've believed it because we, we wanted to have answers. We want, we want to have an explanation for the things that are, that are happening in our lives. And in doing so, we make God to be someone who he's not. But we all claim that he is. So what's the truth? Is the truth what you're living or is the truth the truth? Is the truth what his word says? Because his word never says that he, he gives sickness or disease or, or temptation or testing or anything. He doesn't, it, the Bible doesn't say that. We've heard that from, from the wisdom of the world. We've heard that from our friends. We've heard that from other Christians. We've heard it from, from people who are trying to make us feel better. In, in doing so, we're actually hurting ourselves more than we're helping. <laughs> what are we doing? It's about time we know the truth, isn't it? Let's do it. Let's get into the truth. So what the devil does, let me paint a scenario for you. So somebody gets sick, and in their sickness, they want to have an explanation. They're just not okay with saying that the devil just gave me sickness because they got to or that sickness came from just being in a sinful world, they have to have an explanation. So they say something like, yeah, God, um, God's trying to teach me a lesson here. You know, I was just too busy with my life, and so God gave me this sickness so that I would slow down and I would just be with him more, so that I'd spend more time with him. Listen, guys, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, really, it really goes through a lot of our minds that God's trying to like draw us towards him by giving us bad things. Just think about it. If God is good, if a tree is good, what, if the roots of the tree and everything in the tree is good, what kind of fruit is it going to produce? Good fruit. There's no bad fruit coming from God. There's nothing bad or evil coming from him but we find some fruit on the ground that's dead and we pick it up and we eat it and we claim it's from the life, the, the tree that's giving life. God, God's not giving us, he's just not giving us the sickness. So we have the story where he's trying to teach me a lesson and so then we make it all spiritual and say, yeah, he's, he was trying to teach me a lesson. I just need to be with him. <coughs> Thanks, God, for giving me this to slow me down. Here, here's the deal. God, can, God takes bad things and he flips them to good. But God never causes bad things to flip them for good. I'll say that again. God can take bad things and flip them into good things to bring good out of them. But God never causes bad things in order to flip them into good things. That, that would be silly, wouldn't it? It'd be a little weird for him to do that. If he did that, we could question him, but he doesn't do that, so we cannot question him. But if you believe that, you will question him. If you believe that he's, he's doing those things to you, you will question him because you won't be able to trust him. Not trust him with your salvation, but trust him like a, like a good father, like a good friend, like a good dad, like someone who you really trust. So what the devil does is he comes in, sneaks in, he frames God, he touches someone, he has sickness, and then he slips away in, into the weeds like the little snake that he is, and God gives the rap for it. He frames him. And we're naive enough to believe the lie that he's speaking to us, but if we ever read the book, if we ever knew the word and listened to his voice, it would be exposed in an instant. Because the whole message of the Bible is claiming that he is good and all good gifts come from the Father. 
The devil comes to steal. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You read that, there's done, mic drop, done, I can be done. It's the only, it's the answer. So if he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, what did God come to give life, life more abundantly, then we have our answer, don't we? We're gonna keep going though. So we want these explanations, we want these answers, and in doing so, the devil is able to frame God for what he does. <laughs> good thing we know the truth now, eh? That's good. So, th that first part was all about, you could say, sickness, disease. The second part where people get maybe tripped up a little bit with, with God is them, is God testing or tempting them. So I got a verse for you that is really good and it's gonna bring life and I really don't have to say much about this topic after this because it's gonna pretty much do it. James 1, 12 through 18. <laughs> this is good. This is good. <laughs> you guys, if we would ever just read it, we would, we would laugh at ourselves. We wouldn't feel condemned because he's in us. There's no condemnation in Christ. We would just feel silly because we believed a lie. Listen, once you know the truth, it's not hard. It's not, I just spit everywhere. <laughs> once you know the truth, it's not hard. It's not like, I know the truth, I know the truth, now I need to become the truth. It's like, oh, the truth. It's easy. It might hurt a little bit because you have to grow in the process, but the truth is the truth. So God, James 1, 12 through 18. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Okay, I want to stop there. When we, when we see that... Our minds say, oh God, God, God must give, the, he must be the author, the creator of the tempting and the testing. It never says that. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Okay? Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. <laughs> I honestly, I've read this book when I was preparing for this, I, I was laughing. I was laughing reading this because it's so funny that we would believe otherwise. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. God is not tempting you. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Here's, here's three key, four key words that I want you to, to recognize. So we don't need to feel bad about believing this, this lie, because obviously the people who this was written to believe the same thing. So don't be misled. Don't be misled. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possessions. All good and perfect gifts come down from heaven. God is not tempting us. He's not putting things in our path to make us trip and fall. Huh, go figure, he's not doing those things. If it's not him, who else is it gonna be? Well, this, the verse clearly says that it, our temptation comes from our own desires. It's the fall of Adam, it's Romans 5. We were born into Adam, we were born into this sinful nature. So those temptations come either from our sinful nature or they come from the devil not God. He does not tempt us. He's, but he's a good, you guys, he's really good. Like really good. First Corinthians 10, 13. This verse I think can be very misinterpreted um, pretty easily, but it's important that we really focus in on what it's actually saying. I'm gonna read two different translations, the New Living Translation and the NIV. Um, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. 
He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. NIV, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Here's the deal, guys. We read this verse and we think that God is actually tempting us and he's the orchestrator or the creator of the temptation that's in your life and it's just not the case. He says when temptation comes, the only way God is interacting or a participant in your temptation is giving you the way out. It's the only way he's participating within your temptation. He's not giving it to you. Read it carefully. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. What that means. Listen, guys, your temptations, the sin is not, like, you're not alone. Like, it's a sinful nature. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And we automatically think that we cannot be tempted more than we can bear. So God is the one giving us because he knows what we can bear. So he's the one giving us these temptations. No, it doesn't say that. And that's what I used to believe, that God was the one who was tempting us. No, it says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. You know why it says that? You want to know why it says that? Because he's given you his spirit so you can handle anything. He's given us grace. He's given us him. So whatever comes our way, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. He's given you ability to overcome temptations. He's not giving you the temptations. This is good news. (laughs) I'm gonna keep going. 2 Corinthians 4.4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The devil is trying to destroy the image of God. The nature of God. He's trying to pervert our perspective so that we see God as something that he's not. And if he can do that, then he can destroy the intimacy that we can have with him because we'll never approach him with confidence because we're afraid that he might give us something evil or bad. But the devil has not changed his tactics. And I think it, this is just funny to me. It's just funny. I mean, it's good, it's truth. It's just funny though. I love it. So, <laughs> let's go back to Jesus, right? So Jesus is, He's living on earth. Everything Jesus did was good. Everything he did was good. There was no evil in him. There was no sin in him. He was the perfect representation of God. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus was good. He healed people. He raised the dead. He healed the blind. He cleansed the leopard. He, he was just good. And what, it, what was the tool or the method that God used to distract the people of his time? You know what they said about Jesus. He's demon possessed. What? That's what the people in the Bible, the Pharisees, called Jesus demon possessed. (laughs) And we think it's funny. We think back, how could anyone ever think that Jesus was demon possessed? How could they ever think he's not good? He healed the sick, he did all these good things. And guess what? The devil is doing the same thing to us. God's only done good, but he's convinced us that he's bad. God is good, guys, but the devil's convinced, he's, he's talking to the church, he's, he's talking through people, and he's convincing the church slowly, this, this creep, this way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. This way that seems right, this, this way that has an explanation that has an answer. Listen, guys, he's not changed, and the cool thing is, how did Jesus, you guys, how did Jesus respond? How did he respond to people calling him demon-possessed? Did he say, did you see what I've done? I've done this, 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 and this, and this, this. I'm not demon-possessed. How could they? He didn't go to Peter and say, Peter, how could they call him demon-possessed? I did all these good things. No, he didn't do that. You know what he just did? He knew that he was good. He He didn't have to prove himself. He just knew that he was good. And God's the same way. God's not up in heaven saying, oh my gosh, they think I'm bad. They think I'm bad. You guys, he's pretty secure with himself. (laughs) <laughs> like, like God doesn't need to prove that he's good to us because he's already proved it like he doesn't have to anymore 
Like, we just know that he's good. And when the, when the bad comes, we know it's the devil. You see, we've complicated it so much to have answers when in really it's the simplicity of the gospel. It's the simplicity of truth. When you want answers, that's when you'll find the incorrect ones. We only have one answer. Heaven gave that answer 2,000 years ago. It's Jesus to come and live inside of us, that God actually loved humankind, mankind, humans. <laughs> he loved humans so much that he sent his son to become sin so that we could be the righteousness of God, so that we could be his again. Remember we talked about last week, he's inside of us. He likes to be there. He likes to be with us, guys. <laughs> He's good. Um, my second very profound point, God is good. So point one, devil's bad. Point two, God is good. I wanted to keep it really simple because it is simple. Amen. James 1.17, we already read it. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in heavens. So all the good things that, that exist are from God. All the bad things that exist are from the devil. Let's just stop trying to, to, to find an explanation for everything. This is our explanation. John 10.10, 10. we already read it. I've come to give life and life more abundantly. Life to the full. So how do we know God is good though? I can come up here and say God's good, but how are you gonna believe me? Well, I mentioned it just a second ago and I wanna go more in depth. Jesus is the exact representation of God. If you've seen Jesus or if you read about Jesus or if you heard about Jesus or, and, and you read him in the Bible, it's what God would have done. He said, I only do what the Father is doing. I only say what the Father is saying. So God and Jesus are pretty tight. Like he was only doing what God was telling him to do. So how do, we, how do we know God's good? We look at Jesus. John 4, 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. The only reason he came to earth was to finish God's work, to do God's work. John 6, 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. You guys, it's God's will that everyone be saved. God, God is not sending people to hell. He's given the opportunity to everyone to choose life everyone. We chose death from the beginning and he's so good that he saw life in us even when we were dead. Amen. He's good. He wants everyone to know Jesus. He wants everyone to know who they are and who they are is his. So Jesus is the exact representation of God. So I want to, I want to visit back to this like sickness deal and, 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 I want to highlight some things. So we have, so we have sickness, right? Or, and you know, we went through that scenario where people say, well, God gave me this to teach me a lesson. Here's the problem. God is only good. There is no evil or sin in God. He is perfect. If then there was no sin in God, then there was no death in God, since death is the result of sin. Did you catch that? If then there is no sin in God, then there is no death in God, since death is a result of sin. So it's not from him because it'd be contrary to anything he ever was. So Jesus is our perfect example. Let's look at some of the things that Jesus did. In John 4, Jesus cured the old man's son. In Mark 1, Jesus cured Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. In Mark 1, Jesus healed a leper. In Matthew 8, Jesus healed the centurion's servant. In Luke 7, Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead. In Matthew 9, Jesus cured the paralytic. In Matthew 9, Jesus raised the ruler's daughter from the dead. In uh, Luke 8, Jesus cured a woman of an issue of blood. In Matthew 9, Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men. In Matthew 9, Jesus loosened the tongue of a man who could not speak. In John 5, Jesus healed an invalid man at the pool of Bethsaida. And in Matthew 12, Jesus restored a withered hand. So let's just beg the question, right? Let's beg the question that 
God does give sickness to people to teach them a lesson. Let's see what happens, and I'm, I'm going to destroy that argument really quick, well, the Bible is. So if, if, if it's God's will for someone to be sick, and Jesus is the exact representation of God, and he only came to do the will of God, then by him healing and curing diseases, he would be going against what the will of the Father was. Does that make sense? So if he only came to do the will of the Father, that means that the sickness came from somewhere else. It didn't come from God because he only came to do the will of the Father, and they cannot contradict each other. So there's only one solution, and here it is, John 1, 3, 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. I'm done. So God's goodness. So what is God's goodness based off of? God's goodness is based off of one thing. One thing. It's this. James 1, 18, we read it, that we are his prized possessions. It must be independent from our circumstances, guys. It's in the simplicity of the gospel, it's the simplicity of Jesus that we find that he's good. If it's based on your circumstances, he'll be good one day and bad the next day. Because guess what? That means that you have a button on your body and the devil's just gonna be touching that button because he knows it's gonna get you. And he knows that you're only actually serving, we're actually serving God for ourselves. He wants us to become so free from that and just to know that he's good. That he is good. I wanna tell you a story. It was actually, it took place here at Access and it was probably three years ago. Um, so I was here and I prayed for this guy's foot, he had, he had some foot problems. I don't know if he broke his foot or whatever, but he, he couldn't walk properly. And he was actually a dancer and he needed a healthy foot to dance. So I went and prayed for him. And I went down to my knee, I prayed for him. And I said, how's it feel, man? Like, I was excited. He's like, oh, it feels the same. So I prayed again, I said, Jesus' name be healed in Jesus' name. I said, how's it feel? And he was like, he was shocked. And his foot, became whole in that instant. That's a good, that's, that's good. But here's the point of my story. I remember going to the back and I remember praising God and saying, God, you're so good. God, you're so amazing that you would even use me. God, you're so good. And last night I was laying in my bed before I went to bed and God reminded me of that moment. And this is what he told me. He said, Jake, my goodness I wrote it down because I'm, I'm losing it here. He said, healing, miracles, provision, favor is only a display of my goodness. It does not prove my goodness. Amen. If, we make, if we make the healings and the miracles and the favor all about his goodness, then when, when we don't get his goodness, when we don't get to see that, we'll actually be destroyed. His goodness is so independent from anything, but the miracles and all the good things that happen are just a display of his goodness. And we can walk in that goodness all the time, but, it can't, but our, our contentment and our perspective of his goodness cannot be dependent on those things. Does that make sense? Because what happens is, because is, uh, a year and a half ago, I, I tore my ACL and I was like, on, I was like, this thing's getting healed. I was believing for it. I was believing for it. I had no doubt in my mind. Gabe went me, with me to the hospital and we were like, you know what, we're not, even, we're not even scared. Like, we're not fearful. Guess what, nothing happened. That's okay. Does that mean he's not good? No, it just means the devil's bad. It's simple. It's simple. When we try to find answers, that's when we get in trouble. So, uh, point three, his goodness changes things. He's so for us, guys. Hebrews 4, 6. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive and find grace to help us in our time of weed, of weed need. <laughs> wow. So we can approach him with confidence, guys, because we know he's good. And here's the reality. If you don't think he's good, you'll never approach with confidence because you'll be worried about what he's going to give you next. So we need to be able to approach him with confidence knowing that he's good. If we approach him apart from his goodness, we'll never receive his fullest. Because we'll always be, we'll, we just won't trust him. Because if he's giving these things, giving us these things that we're praying for him to take away, he's not giving us those things. So we need to approach his throne of grace with confidence. Confidence. You only approach, if you have a good boss, you know you can go to that boss and approach him with confidence and say anything. If you have a bad boss, you go in there, you're going to be like, okay, um, yeah, you know, um, you know that inventory I was supposed to take, inventory I was supposed to take, I kind of messed it up and I miscounted. He's going to be, what did you do? It's a bad boss. You come in, you're like, eh, no confidence. You come in with a good boss who's gracious <laughs> and who cares about his workers, he'll say, it's okay, man. Well, well, you know, he might not be happy, but, and that's why God's so much better than we are. <laughs> but he'll give you grace. He'll say, you can stand confident knowing that your boss is gonna be for you. Yeah. It's the same way with God. We need to approach him with confidence. Um, Romans 2, 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God is supposed to lead us to repentance. It's his goodness that's supposed to make us realize that, wow, he actually is so for me. He's actually so in love with me. He actually wants the best for me. And when you realize that, it will lead you to a place of repentance or moving away from the sin that's keeping you down. But you need, to be able, you need to know that it's from his goodness. But here's the, here's the deal. He's so good, but he's so good that he lets us choose. He's never going to make you do anything that you don't want to do. He's pursuing you and he loves you, but he'll never make you do anything. We have our own free will. We have our own free choice. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It's the simplicity, um, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear lest somehow as, they, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If we move away from simplicity, we start moving away and moving towards finding answers. It's simple. And it's only in the, sim in the simplicity of the gospel that we can approach God's goodness. And we can approach his throne with confidence and say, you know what? I know that I'm not perfect, but I know that he is good. And I know that he sees me for more than I see myself. He sees me for my potential. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, guys. It's so funny. Nick, Nick showed me a, a, a thing on YouTube today. I was speaking on this, and he showed um, Bill Johnson, a guy from Bethel um, in California. He was, he was sharing a little video, and it was about the goodness of God. I was like, wow, it's so good. <laughs> this is what he said. He's so much better than we think, so it's time we start changing the way we think. He's so much better than we think, so it's time we start changing the way we think. Amen. You guys, Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do so much more than we could ever imagine or think. He's so for us. He's so in love with us. He has so many good things planned for our lives. We just need to start believing it. Not believing in ourselves, but believing that he believes in us. And if he is for us, who cares who's against us? If he is for us, 
who can be against us? It's good news, and he's so good. He's so, so good. And if you focus and you, and you put your eyes and your attention on his goodness, you can stand and say, oh my gosh, this is too good to be true. <laughs> but it, it is true. So God, I thank you that you are good and that the devil is bad and that you have no bad in you. And when we start approaching the throne, approaching him, we can actually start to have intimacy with him. We actually start to trust him and believe in ourselves the way that he believes in us. Because you guys, if he didn't believe in you, if he didn't believe in mankind, he never would have sent his son. Come on. I, I, shared this, I shared this the first time I spoke, it was about love. The price that you pay determines the value of something. And I know you're all Dutch or you're all very cheap, so you're never gonna pay for anything unless it's worth it. And God's the same way. He's never gonna pay for anything unless it's worth it, right? And guess what he paid for you? He paid his, he paid his son, he paid himself. He paid himself for you, it means he must believe in you, right? Our values determine not on our circumstances, it's determined on what he sees in us and the value that he sees. And he said, it's worth my son to get you. Amen. That's good news. <laughs> it's the simplicity of, of the gospel of Jesus loving us so much. And it's what we need to keep our eyes on. It's on his goodness. It's only on his goodness. Things can start to change because the goodness of God leads to repentance. It would start changing the way you think. If you're just trying to be a better person, it's going to be really hard. If you're just trying to have a better day, tomorrow might be better, but the next day might be just like the day before. But if you approach his throne of good, of, of, with confidence because he's good, you'll be able, you'll just know he's good and he loves you and it'll not be about having a better day. It'll be about he believes in you. And who knows that the only way that you can really reach your potential if someone believes in you, and here's the deal, you cannot wait for someone to believe in you to start believing in yourself because here's the reality. He believes in you so much. And if we start fixing your eyes on that, we'll actually start to accomplish some things. So I want to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to do one more song. You can probably all guess what the song is going to be. So who, who thinks they got to yell it out? Mm, somebody got it over there. So what I want to do, though, I want to, in, I want to invite you to simply, <laughs> simply just, even if you don't believe it, just try it, okay? God, if you are good, show me how good you are. God, if what Pastor Jake says is true, then just reveal it to me. Here's the deal. It can come in your ears all day long. I can teach you. I can share your Bible verses, but unless the Holy Spirit teaches you, it'll never become a reality. He needs to teach you. He's your teacher. He is our teacher. So allow him to teach you how good he is today. We're going to go through this song. Allow him to teach you. And if you need to revisit some areas of your life that you've been blaming God, or let's say you were mad at God for something that happened, revisit those and allow him to speak to you the truth about that issue. That it wasn't him. Because you'll, you'll, you'll break down. You will. Because you'll be like, oh my gosh, oh I was believing it all. I was, it'll happen, and I believe it's going to happen because he's so good. He's not mad at you for believing a lie. He just wants you to believe the truth. So um, I'm just going to pray before we get started, and then we're going to get right into it. Do you want me to take this? Sure. So God, thank you for this time together. God, we thank you that you are good. You are more than good. You're perfect. during this time, God, I ask that you just teach us and show us and reveal to us how good you are. Give us an encounter with your love that will change our lives forever, God. And help us to realize the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. The simplicity that he loved us so much. And the reality that he loved us so much. It's not a Bible story. It's not fiction. It's the truth and it's the most real thing that we could ever encounter. So God, I pray that you have your way inside of our hearts and you teach us how good you are. You're amazing, God. 
Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here. You're inside of us. Thank you, God, that you fill us with your fullness, God. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this series. For more information, call 616-534-4923 or visit us at reslife.org.